Hello, everybody, Hi. and welcome back to another uh, episode of Positively Connected in Dogs. Today, I have another awesome guest with me. Her name is Nina Russell, and she owns and works at Nonstop Dog Training. Nina, thank you so much for joining us today. Absolutely. I'm happy to be here. Today, we're talking about something fun that we've never talked about before. We are going to be talking about bite sports, which is something, Nina, that you enjoy with your dogs. So talk to us a little bit about bite sports, because there's a lot of names out there, a lot of different categories of the sport, and all of the sports have their own little um, kind of ways of doing things, different behaviors, different skills that the dogs need to have. So what are bite sports, Nina? Um, bite sports are my hobby, first of all, and, um, the most commonly seen ones in the U S are, um, IGP, which stands for something in German, but is formally IPO, formally VPG, formally Schutzend, which is tracking obedience and protection. Um, and it's a German sport that was created for German shepherds to test the working ability. Um, it's open to all breeds with the caveat that there's not um, separate um, classes for like jumps and stuff. So mm -hmm. the dog has to, I mean, has to be able to do a meter jump and a six foot A frame. Um, and then there's ring sports and the, the two ring sports that are commonly seen here in the US are Mondio ring um, and French ring. And um, though I don't do those, I'm, I'm just kind of, getting into a little bit, but I'm not even like a newborn in that area. I'm like a fetus. So <laughs> um, we'll be uh, going for our brevet this year, hopefully, or no, next year, because there's not a trial. I think there's not any trials left. So anyway, um, French ring and Mondio ring um, are suit sports. So the dogs bite suits versus um, IGP. They bite the sleeve. And then the other common bite sport is PSA and that's protection sport association. I've been to a few trials, but I, again, that's just not where my energy lies, but I think we have a link that we'll, we'll share if you're interested in it. Um, but it's, it's a lot more. So on one end is as IGP shuts end and it's very stylized training. So it's, um, it's the same every time it's um, a lot of precision. Um, and it's very stylized obedience and protection work and then um french ring is a little more like that and um it, but it's in a suit but it's the same every time there's a like a routine mm -hmm. and then in mondio it's different every time and there's themes so like it could be you know friday the 13th or it could be mardi gras or it could be whatever the club wants to do so if you like something that changes every time um it's a lot less formalized stylized you don't get um like style points like you do mm -hmm. in, in igp um then that appeals to a lot of people and then psa is like crazy bite biting situations like they do like carjackings and all kinds of stuff and again i've just been to a few trials i don't know psa as well yeah um but igp the difference with igp and like ring sports and igp there's um, the scoring is a little subjective as in they reward the attitude of the dog. Okay. So there's, there's definitely like what each, each exercise is worth a certain amount of points. But if you do the exercise correctly, but your dog doesn't look happy, powerful with a good attitude, they can take all your points except for the minimum. Okay. Um, so um, like an exercise, like coming and barking in the blind, it's more than just barking in the blind. The, the dog has to really like show power. Mm -hmm. And so you, you get points for the dog's attitude, which is, you don't, you don't see that in the ring sports. So it's not just testing their ability to do it, but to see how much their head might be in the game while they're doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and how much they like enjoy it or mm -hmm. are, are driving, you know, they're, what are they bringing to the table? Um, and so, it, and it's not like one is harder or it, like at the top levels, they're both hard sports. Yeah. Um, they're just, they're just scored. That's like a different culture around each sport and they're scored a little bit, a little differently. So, so how did you choose the one that you got involved in? 
How did you decide um, which route of the bitey sports you wanted to go? I didn't even know. So when I got into it with my first dog, I got a Doberman and um, I just got him to train and I was like, we're just, you know, we're going to dabble. Mm -hmm. And he was a very typical, like first bite sport dog, as in I didn't get him from like working lines mm -hmm. and um, he, he didn't end up really liking the bite biting portion of things. Um, so he was, you know, he's my soul dog. He was, um, he, you know, changed the course of my life, but mm -hmm. he, um, was just a dog that I got to train. I was like, well, I always wanted Doberman. I wanted to train. And so I started looking around, um, and there's, there was a Schutzen club near me mm -hmm. and that's really what it came down to. And I mean, ring sport wasn't even in the area at that time. So I, it didn't come up in my Google searching and, um, no clubs were around. And so I just, I found a local Schutzen club and and went out there and the rest is history. So you started with him and did you know you wanted to compete right away or were you kind of just looking to get started and kind of see what it was all about? Um, after I went out to the club a couple of times, I was pretty hooked. Um, it was, it's just an interesting sport. You know, it's an mm -hmm. interesting thing to play with your dog. And if they like to play the game, um, it's fun, you know, yeah. so even if you're, you don't want to be compete, I mean, there's all different levels, right? There's room for everyone at, at the table. Um, so that's another thing that's really, assuming you have a dog who likes to play the game, you know? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So talk to us a little bit about the dog that you have now, because I know we've got some videos that we're going to show a little later of you working with her. Um, but talk to us about her, because I know she's been kind of an exciting new project for you. Yes. Um, yeah. So she's, <laughs> um, she's a Malinois. She's two. And um, <laughs> I would never like, if you're, if you really like want to get into bite sports, I would not encourage you to go get a random Malinois or GSD like, like I did. Um, this just, it was so serendipitous that it worked out and the, I lost a lot of sleep over it because I'd kind of been waiting for like 10 years to get my next fight. And I'm like, I'm like looking at, can I, you know, go to Belgium and stay for two weeks and like mm -hmm. got a dog, you know, I'm just like, I've been waiting for this dog forever. And this dog came through a local rescue. And I just, it's one of those situations where I was like, Oh, I'll assess the dog. I, there's no way that yeah. it's going to be my next dog. And fast forward two years later, uh, it's just worked out, but <laughs> it was a, it's a big risk. Um, because it takes so much time and, um, effort to get a dog to ready to compete. And, mm -hmm. uh, it does take a certain kind of dog who wants to play this game. And, and she happens to be that, and she happens to be healthy and, you know, it's, yeah. it's worked out, but, uh, it's a huge risk that I took. Um, so <laughs> if your heart is set on doing bite sports, I would not just go to the shelter and get a dog. Mm -hmm. Um, but if you have a dog from unknown origins who likes to play the game, that shouldn't stop you either. Like where you got yeah. a dog shouldn't stop you from, from trying it out if you like it. So um, she's two, we've got a BH. We're um, looking to go for our one this summer. And so in IGP, it's um, you, you have to get a temperament test and you have to kind of pass a temperament test slash obedience test. It's a cer certificate rather mm -hmm. than like a title in order to show for a title. And so okay. the titles are um, IGP one, two, and three, three being the hardest. And um, a BH is kind of like an AKC CD, so a companion dog, mm -hmm. and um, a CGC in one in a way. Okay. So it's a big healing pattern. Um, and the, like a, a big difference, if anyone is familiar with AKC obedience, where the judge tells you what to do in, in IGP, you have to have it memorized. Mm -hmm. So it's, and it's the same every time. It's not a big deal, but the judge isn't going to tell you what to do once you get out there. Um, so it's a big healing pattern, um, like sit in motion, down in motion, healing, tell the dog to sit, recall, go through a group, that kind of thing. And then um, there's a, a traffic portion, which is the dog should be kind of at, at liberty or free, you know, not necessarily in heel, mm -hmm. but um, you like walk by another dog and a biker and a jogger and you leave your dog tied out and go out of sight and another dog walks by and you 
like scan them with the um like the microchip mm -hmm. and they just can't show any fear or aggression okay so that's and do you just have to do that once in order to get yeah. that bh okay and then you're allowed to compete for your ig1 ig2 igp yeah yeah okay cool so talk to us about what that looks like so when so working towards your igp1 what um you, you mentioned healing you mentioned you know the biting portion what separate skills does the dog have to have and um do you want me to share we've got some of those videos i guess let's talk about what it looks like first and then we can share the videos and you can kind of walk us through what we're looking at okay so um in igp it's you're tested in tracking obedience and protection and you have to pass all three in the same trial and typically that's the same it's the same day um except, you know especially in the us where trials mm -hmm. tend to be smaller um an exception would be like if you're at a big championship with a lot of competitors you might have tracking one day and protection and obedience the next day so okay you've got to pass all three of those each one is out of 100 points so you've got to get at least 70 to pass and um tracking so it was one two three and they get progressively harder and there's more pressure like um as you move as you move through the sport so um tracking I don't know if you necessarily need, well, I'll, we'll link the, um, like rules and stuff. So if you're yeah. interested in bites, first thing I say is like, go read the rule book or at least skim over it. So you kind of have an idea of what's happening because mm -hmm. there's a lot of nuance. So that's, that's kind of the wonderful thing about IGP is that, um, or, or bite sports in general is that it's, it's pretty simple to understand, okay, tracking obedience protection, the dog has to follow the scent of mm -hmm. disturbed vegetation and locate articles and make turns. Um, and but it gets deep like it gets as deep as you want it to get so there's a, there's a lot going on under the surface although it's it's an igp it's just deceptively very simple to mm -hmm. understand so um obedience is healing um a sit in motion down in motion stand in motion uh three retrieves so you retrieve on the flat um, you retrieve over a jump and over an A-frame. And then in, in the one, it's all done with a, a one pound dumbbell. In the two, the flat is done with the two pound dumbbell. And then the jump and the A-frame are always done with the one pound. And in the three, the flat is done with the three pound dumbbell. So it's a big okay. dumbbell. Yep. Um, and so uh, just to kind of, the culture of IGP, the, the retrieve is worth 40 points out of a hundred. Um, and it's all about it's kind of like the holy grail of the obedience like if you've got a good retrieve um that's that's big points for you yeah. and the the ideal retrieve is as fast as a dog can goes out grabs it swimmers turn and runs back as fast as they can so they run back as fast as they went out um they don't slow down but they land perfectly in front of you, perfectly straight, as close as they can to you without touching you. And they hold the dumbbell really firmly and calmly. Mm -hmm. um, and then you wait one, 1,000, two, 1,000, touch the dumbbell, then tell them out, put it down, wait again and have them finish. So it's, um, it's that, I know I like get chills talking about it. I get so, yeah. <laughs> so weird. I, that's so weird, I think, but um, <laughs> that's, that's the ideal, right? Is that the dog can, can switch really quickly and be so responsive and so fast and give you so much try mm -hmm. um, while being correct. Yeah. And I think that's the hard part of it as well, because you need the dog to be able to function. You and I were talking about that earlier, function at a high arousal or high kind of drive, but they also still need to be thinking, right? And there's that balance between getting the dog jazzed up and engaged and aroused, but also them still being able to respond to all of those cues. Yeah. Yeah. And, so, and then that. Yeah. No, go ahead. Well, yeah. That. that yeah, that carries over into into protection too, which is kind of like the most iconic phase of the sport, mm -hmm. um, where the dog should be wholly focused on the helper and really bringing power um, to to this game. Um, 
but also immediately responsive to the handler, you know, mm -hmm. even from a distance. So they are, um, there's, there's some parallels in herding too, which is really interesting because with the herding dog, you want the dog, like you don't want the dog looking at you every time you tell it to go right or left or right. right. Like it needs to be entirely focused on the stock, but re but responsive almost, almost reflexively, you know, like mm -hmm. they, they hear you and respond quickly. And that's really the, the ideal picture and protection is the same, but the dog is completely focused um, on controlling the movement of the helper, mm -hmm. but responds to the handler immediately and is able to engage and disengage, um, yeah. as, you know, with, with minimal conflict. Um, yeah. So. so our obedience portion has that retrieve. It has the healing that you mentioned. Um, then, then we also have the protection component of it. So mm -hmm. what's involved in that? So in, in the protection component, they um, they do what's called a blind search where they find they find the helper. Helper's always in the same place though. So um, they have to look in these little blinds, um, mm -hmm. like little half TPs. Um, and then when they find the guy, uh, the helper, could be a girl, find, find the helper, um, they have to guard. So they need to bark convincingly, rhythmically, with power, without touching or bothering the helper um, until you come and get the dog. And so, and there's, again, it's very simple, but then there's lots of nuance to that. So um, in the sport, it's the same every time. They know mm -hmm. where the helper is. So the blind search is an obedience exercise and there's all kinds of little tips and tricks and things that you can do to, um, to make the blind search look the way that you want, want it to look. But um, in the end, they know that the helper is in blind six. He's always in blind six. He's always in the same place, but the dog needs to run the blinds fast and with power. Um, even though they know it's not, the guy's not in blind one, the guy's not in blind two, but they still need to run their you know, fast and look and then whip around and come back. Um, and so it's just, it's all just a very interesting training problem mm -hmm. um, of how, of how to get that. And there's so many different ways to get it. Um, but then once they find the guy, they're away from you and they need to, and like, and the, the helper is completely neutral. So they have to, to bring something to the table. It takes a certain attitude to find this helper who's completely neutral and bark at them like don't you dare move mm -hmm. um and be really confident and powerful and bark rhythmically and so that's again where like the barking is scored yeah so, you know in in igp um which just it makes it another interesting problem to solve yeah now so that everyone can visualize this, I assume this is how I envision it. And I, again, I don't know anything about bike sports. So I see you standing with the dog, probably in like a heel position, uh, you know, sitting or standing, the blinds are all in a row out in front of you. Is that right? Um, so yeah, that's a good point. Um, there, so think of it like a soccer field and okay. there's, um, so to your left on one end, if you're on one end of the field is, yep uh blind one okay and then they're kind of offset and then blind two three, so do you send the dog to each one and they return to you or do you send the dog out and they search all of them and then get to the yeah, person they, so you send them around one they come back in front of you send them around two they go okay. around come back in front of you and you're moving down the midline of the field okay and they're kind so, of yeah. going out to the blind coming back you send them out again they come back Yes. Okay. Yeah. So I assume they stay in motion then. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And there's rules for how they can run the blind as well. Um, and we can pull up a video. Like I don't have a video of a full blind search, but we could pull one up if, mm -hmm. if that would help. Yeah. Um, um, one more question on that. So that's got my brain running because obviously we know that dogs are very good at patterns and they're very good at um, anticipating if this is going to be the same every time, then why don't I just go right to the end, find the person. So when you're training, do you often mix up the location of where the person is so that the dog isn't just breezing past and not checking? Cause I imagine you want them to look, even though it's always at the end, the person's always in that last blind. I assume you want them to search as if the person could be there. 
Yeah. So there's, like I said, there's all kinds of ways to train that. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, a common one is playing kind of the shell game where there mm -hmm. is a helper hidden in different places. Um, and that tends, you know, and that tends to work, right? Um, except dogs know when they're in a trial, like yeah, there's trial an environment. Yeah. When you, yeah, when you're in a trial. Um, so it does, it, yes, they should think that there's maybe a surprise or a toy. And um, like I said, there's lots of ways to train it. But um, it also comes down to obedience, like mm -hmm. the dog, like this is how we, in order to get there, you have to go through these, these steps. Yeah. Um, but then also the problem of keeping the dog's attitude up mm -hmm. is, you know, there's that balance. So, right. Right. So we talked a little bit about the obedience portion. Now we talked about the protection portion and then there's also tracking when you're doing IJP. Um, so is that just like AKC tracking? What does that look like? Um, it's different than AKC in that it is it, like everything else in IGP, it is very stylized. So it's not, whereas AKC tracking, this is just my opinion of the two. Mm -hmm. um, AJ, AKC is a little more real life. So mm -hmm. they, it's not scored, right? It's pass or fail. Um, and the goal is just like to to track and find the end. Um, whereas in IGP, it's footstep tracking. So it's it's focused more on not just find the end, um, but show me each footstep with a deep nose um, and then indicate the article with a very, with a straight down. So indicate that when they come across an article, which is like um, a piece of wood or leather or carpet, mm -hmm. um, when they hit it, they should lie down or they should indicate immediately and straight. So most people have the dog down. Um, although in the rules, it doesn't like you can choose any indication. Uh, I've only ever seen dogs down, um, but they should, if the dog is crooked, you get points off. If the mm -hmm. dog is slow, you get points off, that kind of thing. Um, and if the dog, like every time they lift their head up off the track, you get points off. So again, how can you convince the dog who, I mean, the dogs, they can smell a cancer cell. Like yeah. they don't need to scan each footstep, but we're saying like, this is the, the weird human game that we've created yeah. um, for this sport. And how can I, get the dog to do this behavior mm -hmm. um, and solve the problem this way. And so again, there's all kinds of, there's all kinds of methods that you can use for tracking to get that. And, it, and I will say like, we are talking about the ideal yeah. picture. And um, so it, it, again, if you're interested in bite sports, it can be a little overwhelming to like watch performances at the national or world level and think like, wow, I'll never yeah. get there. So if you're interested in, I would go to club trials too, because while we are working towards the ideal there, mm -hmm. I think there is room at the table for everyone um, yeah. who like, I'm not working towards going to the worlds. I just yeah. enjoy playing this game with my dog. Um, so I think it comes down to, to like, how do you and the dog in front of you enjoy training and what's realistic for you? Yep. Yep. I love that. So let's take a look now, if that's okay with you at some of the videos that you sent over and you can kind of walk us through, cause they kind of show you working with your dog and the training process of it. Yeah. So yeah. Are you going to share the screen? I am. I'm going to attempt to, let's see here. <laughs> okay. Can you see that? Can I you cannot. Oh, um, well, that's a problem. <laughs> oh, okay. Hold on. There we go. Um, so let's see here if I can move these around. Okay. Can you still hear me? Yes. Okay. Perfect. So I'm going to pop this up larger for us. And can you walk us through what we are seeing here? Yes. Okay. So, um, this is how I, how I warm my dog up. So basically she's off camera. I put a toy down where she can't get to it. And I just want to know, like, are you, are you ready to play this game? Do I have your attention? Right? Because mm -hmm. we want a lot of try. Um, but I also need her brain. So, 
um, I'm just taking her through what I what I, is my startup sequence, which tells her what game we're going to play. So, can I ask her? You know, do you want to play? That's where she jumps up on me, mm-hmm. and then she I do like for me it's usually can you come to heel position? Can you come to heel position on the on the right side, which is not my competition heel position. Um, and then if she looks, looks like she's ready, then I give her the opportunity to come into heel position on the left side. And that's where she goes for us. She goes through my leg um, to get there. And so then um, again, I'm just kind of like taking her temperature and seeing where are you? Can you think, um, do you, are you really driving me to play this game? Cause that's, that's the big one that I think a lot of um, new handlers struggle with and even pet owners so this is where some of some of the stuff that I do I use with pets is Mm -hmm. I want you really pushing me like hey let's do this why don't you give me the the opportunity to heal so that's where I'm healing on the right side and I say are you are you sure you want to do this are you sure you want to play this game and she's like yes just give me the opportunity to be on this left side Mm -hmm. um so then I'm doing some tosses and I want to see will she come back to me immediately? Or like right now she's sniffing. So Mm -hmm. if I'm going to work on something really complicated um, or something where I would need a ton of focus and a lot of try, I need a dog who's not worried about what's on the ground. Right. So again, I'm kind of taking her temperature and using my markers, my location specific markers, which is like I toss a piece of food or come get food from my hand. Okay. Can you respond to these little, I use, um, spin right and left uh, as again, another part of my warm up sequence or my startup sequence where I'm taking her temperature and seeing how can you respond. So you're working on not only figuring out where she's say, like, at. Yeah, go, no, go ahead. Yeah. So she made a mistake there. Um, I told her to sit and then I walked off to get the toy and she followed me. And so I just mm-hmm. reset her. And so I'm looking at if she makes a mistake, Um, And where I don't personally use um, corrections, it's not that I don't tell my dog no or that she's incorrect. I'm looking at it like, okay, if she's making a mistake, then what do I need to change? I'm looking Mm -hmm. at it as feedback from her um, as far as like where where her head is and what I can ask her to do. Right. And so I, I, you know, just set her up again, go um, take the toy out And I think I just sent her to it. I think I used behind. Mm -hmm. Um, So one thing that I use a lot is, um, is markers that tell the dog what to expect because I need her to be able to think and transition, even though there's competing um, desires. Mm -hmm. So like in protection, she wants the helper. That's where she wants to be. But I need her to be focused on me sometimes and focus on him sometimes and be responsive. So I kind of prepare her brain for that um, by using toys or using like there may be a food bowl and I may have a toy in my hand and there may be a toy over there. But can you think and work through that? Right. So. Right. um, And that's we'll see. So that's the video that we just watched is just kind of the warm up of what I'm preparing her like this is the game we're going to play mm-hmm. and can you play this game yes can you respond to the basics and then so on. you're using that I assume both in practice and pre-trial to get her warmed up to do the big picture kind of performance uh yes so um Definitely. Anytime I take the field, I'm going to do my startup sequence, which tells her like to play the game. And so um, in the in practice, if she ever tells me like I can't do this, which for her hasn't really. I mean, we had a few like rough days during Mm -hmm. adolescence, especially where I was like, (laughs) okay, like we're changing our plan. We were going to work on this, but now we're not. Yeah. Um, But it's particularly um, in protection. Um, I really need. So there's that balance of, you know, I want the dog, we want a dog who's just almost out of control. You know, they're just, they're bringing it, they're, you know, not leaving anything um, on the field, they're bringing everything they have, Mm -hmm. but uh, they're responsive. And so, um, like working towards, if if that's the ideal picture, 
um, yeah, I'm going to have my startup sequences that tell her specifically, this is the game we're playing and do I have your head so that we can proceed? Yeah. Because there has been days that we don't, we didn't leave the car. Like we just, it's not very many days, but there's been a few days where I'm like, well, I need to rethink this because yeah. we, you know, if I walk to the field like this, um, it's going to be lost before we start. So, yeah. So can we talk about that for just a minute? Cause that's something that is really hard to do to, you know, balance that line of aroused enough to play the game, but not too aroused that the brain isn't, you know, responsive. Um, so if you kind of tip that point, how do you bring her back down? Or what are some things that you look for that you're thinking, okay, she might be kind of getting too close to that line to help her then recover a little bit? Um, so that's where I use my location specific markers or my re my different reinforcement cues um, because I want to have like I because of the, the way that I enjoy training the way that mm -hmm. I enjoy playing the game um, I have lots of ways to regulate arousal um, so if the dog starts to get too high I can use like food is a good one I can use food to kind of bring her back down um, so I might do um, if she's I think. We might see that in the next video a little bit okay. where I'm using multiple things. But um, even in the warm up, you saw I used I used toy and then can you eat? OK, mm -hmm. can you eat? Can you go back to a toy? And, and if you tug, can you let go of the toy and eat? Um, so it's not so much about like I don't think when I do use food and bite work, which I do, I know it's it's a little bit of um, not so I don't think it's as weird anymore, but um, there was a point, especially when I started in this sport where like you use food for puppies sort of, mm -hmm. but then it just didn't come back out again. Um, so it's important to me that my dog can eat and bite work and can mm -hmm. take food before we go on the field. And it's been a process. It's been it's been a lot of work. Yeah. Um, so it's not that she she would not she would rather not eat. But we just have to kind of slowly teach her, like, I need you to go here. Okay, now come here. Now mm -hmm. go here, now come here. And so I do use food and different types of toys and different types of rewards. So chasing a toy is a little bit different for her than, um, or chasing a Frisbee is going to put her in a different place than than just biting a static toy on the ground. Right. Or, um, something like that. So even being mindful about if you're using a toy reinfor as reinforcement for her, how you're presenting that toy based on where her arousal is. Yeah, and you probably, what kind of toy it is. right. And I assume you probably have a lot of that almost ingrained in muscle memory because in the moment that can be hard to, I mean, that's a lot of thinking that you have to do while you're also trying to work with her. So you have patterns, I assume. Yes, lots of patterns, lots of practice on my own, lots of spreadsheets, mm -hmm. <laughs> lots of taking video and watching um, and and having a, you know, having a dog who's forgiving enough that right. um, when we make a mistake, I'm like, well, that, you know, that's not what I was going for. But I did say like there's times that I, I say nice and I just said it without thinking, but it means food is coming to you. Right. And um and then things kind of get a little messy and it's like okay you know you know, time to go to your mechanics uh -huh. because the dog the dog is right right the dog is always right so yeah well let's take a look at the second video that we've got here I'll pop this back up this is the first one still um, all right can you see the fat nina uh yes okay all right, so this is titled Thinking Work. So talk to us about what we're seeing here. Okay, so this is just immediately after, this is, you know, one long video that I broke up. So um, I am asking her now to think more. So can she drop the toy and then take it again? Can she drop the toy and then eat food even though the toy is right there for her to take? Mm -hmm. Now I do a tossed piece of food and the, the toy is still available. So I'm wondering, is she just going to go back to it? She does. I say, nope, that's not available right now. I ask her to bark, I ask her to bark, I ask her to be quiet, I ask her to bark again. So I'm bringing arousal up right now. So barking gets her pretty jazzed. Mm -hmm. And then I have her sit and then I say chase. So there's a toy on the ground 
And if I say take, she should take the toy on the ground. I said chase. That means I'm going to throw a toy. So she ignores nice. the ball on the ground and I'd get a Frisbee out and throw it for her. Um, so again, I'm asking her to come up in arousal a little bit, then eat food, go back down, then come way up with barking and then discriminate between two things. Take the toy on the ground that's right at your feet or chase a toy mm -hmm. that's not visible. She doesn't know it's there yet. So the barking gets her amped up and then you're using your different cues to make sure she's still thinking, even though that arousal level is a little higher. Correct. Yeah. Okay. So can she bark and then sit and then bark again? And then again, I'm just like checking where is your, where's your head and how quickly can you respond? Because mm -hmm. I, I know what her baseline looks like. Um, so how far are we away from the baseline? If we're not, if we're, if we're not at baseline, where are we? Yeah. Okay. All right, we've got another one here, I'll pop up. So I tell her to be quiet and then get her to bark again. So again, I'm bringing up that arousal, asking her to sit. So there she makes a little mistake. So she's too high and she can't respond to the ready. So I just cue her again and she can. If she repeatedly could not respond, then I would I would bring her back down. Mm -hmm. But she could not go from barking to ready, which is go through my legs to get into heel position. You saw she like went through. Yeah. So that was a down in motion. Basically the dog, you're healing along and you just tell the dog to down. Here I'm playing with two toys. So she should not let go of one toy to get the other. So even if I'm, um, until I cue her to, so she was mm -hmm. hugging on one and I have the other one kind of waving around and she prefers a Frisbee. She prefers it, but you can't just let go of the toy that we're playing to take what you want. Right. And another thing we're looking at, which is just very simple is if she, like this little victory lap, um, does a dog like take toys to go possess them away or do they bring them back? You know, I mm -hmm. really want the dog to... Um, take the toy and bring it back to me so that I know that it's reinforcing to the behavior. So again, now the toy's on the ground and I still need her focus on me. And I'm just kind of telling her what we're about to do, which is a sit in motion, it looks like. So toy's on the ground. I have her sit. She should be 100% focused on me, even though that Frisbee is, is there. I'm also using food to re reward static position, but I'm doing it in a way that creates really like nice, tense focus. Mm -hmm. Again, can she come get food from me instead of going to the toy, which is where, I mean, she really wants that Frisbee. So just doing some healing. I think we're gonna do a down in motion here. That was nice. And so can she, <laughs> can she lay down quickly? Mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah, and I tell her to back up. And then she, behind, can she go? So I have a toy in my pocket. I've got food in my pocket, but there is that food, that, that toy back there. Um, and so I cue her behind, and she should respond immediately to go get the toy behind her. And mm -hmm. then we bring it back to start the game again. So there's a lot of different behaviors that you had to build before you can even get to this point of being able to play this game with her. So talk to us about some of the foundation behaviors before you're even ready to go trial, what you have to work on. Um, the big thing is engagement. Um, and again, like there's a million ways to train. Um, the way that I enjoy training, um, I really need the dog to be able to think and respond um, without relying on correcting them for getting it wrong. Mm -hmm. um, that's just not just not how I enjoy playing the game. So I spend a lot of time in the beginning um, focusing on kind of the foundation pieces, the reinforcement cues um, or location specific markers so that we're speaking the same language so that I can bring her up and down and I can see where her head is at and mm -hmm. I can teach her that there's all kinds of things out there and I want a lot of try from you, 
um, and I want to play this game together up here, but I also need you to be able to think um, mm -hmm. because just unchecked arousal is unpleasant, I think, for the dog and the person. Uh, also, it tends to get you bit. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> just, just out of excitement. So, um, being able to move up and down is really important. Um, being able to eat, that's a big skill. Like, yeah. so just right from the beginning, um, we teach the dogs to eat and to work for food, uh, in a variety of situations and to value that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, toy play is another one. Um, it, if I give a dog a toy and then they take it somewhere else to go chew it up, now our training session is over. Yeah. Right. So, um, and I think with most of our, with many of our dogs who like to play these kind of games, there is a certain amount of possession that we built into. Like, if if they didn't value the thing, then we couldn't use the thing as a reward. Yeah. So teaching them that they can have the thing, but they need to have it with me or mm -hmm. that they, you know, need to bring it back to me to play. So just figuring out like what your dog enjoys and, and how to make that work for, for, for rewards, for reinforcement. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's huge. I, when you were um, doing the, I think it was a sit in motion uh, by the Frisbee, you know, you mentioned that that was like her big reinforcer and for her to choose to stay in place for food and to come to you for food instead of getting that Frisbee, that in and of itself is a huge thing, you know, because she's got access to it. It's right there. So learning how to play that game and stay with you and learn that other reinforcers are going to be there. You know, that comes up with our pet dog people quite a bit is, oh, my dog's not food motivated or my dog's not toy motivated, but you have to build those skills and then manage, you know, the importance of them and make sure that you're doing all of that. You know, there's a really fine balance between all of that. Yes. Yeah. And, um, especially for me, for sport dogs, I need them to be able to switch back. And for me and my mm -hmm. team, how I like training, I need them to be able to switch back and forth from food to toys. Yeah. Um, very, very easily. Um, but I think that's, that's a skill that I focus on with pet dogs too. It's not quite as important to me, but mm -hmm. it is still important because it gives me more options to reinforce things like, right. So if I can have a really, really robust reinforcement toolbox, where I can just, hmm, you know, like what's going to work best for this dog? And I just have a, an array of things to choose from. Um, that just sets us up to be able to do more things and be mm -hmm. more fluent. And and then the training is more fun for both parties, right? It's yeah. more fun for the people and the dogs. Um, if it if we have a limited amount of frustration um, and it's, it's more of a game that we're playing together and less of a do this because I say so, or do this because I have something to bribe you with. Um, yeah. Which just doesn't work long-term. It's not, you know, it's not a good long-term strategy in general. Yep. Yep. I agree. So we've got two more videos that are a little different. I think this is showing some of the uh, protection stuff. I'll pop this up so that you can see this. So talk to us about what is going on in this video. Okay, so this is um, her working on um, barking in the blind. And we're at a point right now where we can do some what's called secondary obedience, which is can can you heal and look at me? Um, and this is a, a video of why it's important to have a spotter because she wasn't sitting there. Uh -huh. um, but here, can you come in and bark with power, um, but not touch? So that's, that's the thing we're working on right now is not touching uh -huh. um and so we, i've used a platform and a variety of things and then i've worked on it on me not just with the helper and um for us i don't have her bite in the blind and that i like, that's a whole if you go down a rabbit hole yeah um, <laughs> on that um but that's just the choice that we've made for us with my dog and i um and so she, if she barks at the man, and this is a whole process that she's, you know, taken two years to do. Uh -huh. If you bark at the man, um, then the toy gets thrown, um, and they will never, they will never bark, um, bite in the blind, um, 
So just for me and my dog in the situation, we have chosen to do it this way. Um, and then the uh, the interesting, like the training, the interesting training that comes from this is that, so I pull her back, we want a little more intensity. If she, if she can come in and still be intense, um, but not touch, you know, she uh -huh. gets the toy thrown and then she gets to fight with Michael. That's my, that's our uh, helper. Um, and that's her favorite thing. Like she wants to fight with um, the helper. Um, right. But the interesting training point is at some point she will be barking there and I'll be coming from the field and I will take um, a position five paces behind her and she should continue to guard and bark until the judge signals you to call the dog out um, in the in the one you can go pick the dog up. Mm -hmm. But um, in the two and the three, the, what you're working towards is you stand there. The dog should be focused on the helper. But again, they know this pattern and, and they know that you're going to call them. So how do you, it's always that pendulum of mm -hmm. focus on the helper, focus on the handler or listening to the handler. So if you push the pendulum too far one way, you call your dog and they won't come or they're slow to come um, or they start to come and then think, ah, I don't think so. Or they mm -hmm. don't get, they end up, they don't end up in the correct heel position, whatever it is. It's just not as accurate. And if you push the pendulum too far the other way, they start looking at you or they, the, their barking decreases in, in mm -hmm. intensity because they're waiting for the call out. And so that's that, that interesting training puzzle of how do you keep things just right in the middle where the dog is completely engaged with the helper. But as soon as they hear, hear foos, which is like come heal, they, they immediately stop barking and come into like fly into heel position and sit and are looking at attention. Um, and so that's the ideal picture. Um, and then, so from there you have the helper step out of the blind and they go to what's called an escape bite. So they walk to a certain point and again, here you have your dog heel with you to a point, another set point um, near the helper. Mm -hmm. You're standing still and you put them in a down and then you go stay in the blind and the helper runs away and you tell the dog to go, you know, chase them and bite the, bite the sleeve. Mm -hmm. And so again, it's that pattern of how do you create that exact balance of, okay, now the helper's moving, but you still are with me. And then we're always going to go to this spot and, and lie down. Right. Mm -hmm. And so the dogs figure that out. Yeah. And so again, you just that you take that into your training plan. And so there's all kinds of things that you can do to keep, keep that pendulum where you want it. But as you're, you're always drinking, always tinkering yeah. with it. Right. Yeah. Well, I imagine too, at that point, arousal level is significantly higher after barking at the helper and the blind, right? And then the person starts to move. So I imagine that even in training, working on arousal level at that moment is important. Yes. Yeah. And, um, and that's again, where the kind of the elegance of the sport is comes in because, um, well, it seems very simple. Like you do the blind search and you bark at the guy and then you do, you know, like then you heal a little bit and you sit and then you chase the guy. Um, there's a lot of pressure for the dog to mm -hmm. mentally, you know, deal with where they have to, I mean, up until the guy runs away, he's completely neutral. So the dog has to bring quite a bit of stuff to the field right where you know they're going to bark at this neutral person um very convincingly and then they're going to pursue the person and then they're going to guard them again before mm -hmm. the person then reattacks or like goes into the dog so it's just it's a very interesting puzzle to solve um for the dog and and um uh, you know they it just amazes me like what <laughs> what we yeah. can do with them yeah. So I think we've got one more video here. Um, let's take a look. Oh, this is just a little, we don't have to necessarily, it's just a little long bite. A short. So this is, yeah. I think the reason why I did this is you can see like us dialoguing. And so that's uh -huh. a really important thing. I think is it 
Schutzen is a team sport. And so being able to um, have people that you can work with, where you can dialogue and share ideas, I think is just really invaluable. So he's just doing a little, this is called a long bite, or it's a baby long bite, essentially. Um, but yeah, that's how we wrapped up our training session. But we're talking like, what do we think is the best thing uh -huh. in this moment? Um, mm -hmm. So that's a really, um, really nice thing. And I think a really necessary thing to have is, is good communication uh -huh. um, between you and your dog, but also the people that you're working with, because you need, you need people in this sport. Yeah. Um, so I think that that will kind of go in line with when we talk about how to get into thing, how to get into yeah. the sport. Yeah. So there are some behaviors here that are beyond what we would ever work on with a pet dog or, or a dog that we normally share our life with, but there are some crossovers. So talk to us about some of the things that you've specifically worked on for your bite sports that then have been beneficial for you, you know, in home life. Yes. Um, so the big one, I think that we've talked about a lot already is just arousal regulation. Yeah. Um, having robust reinforcement system. Um, so even just the mechanics of toy play skills, again, mm -hmm. it's not something that I would like if there are more, if you're in a triage situation where you're trying to be, manage a behavior case, then maybe toy skills aren't what you work on, but if you, mm -hmm. but they can be really beneficial. Um, so I don't, I don't underestimate the fact that if we have toy skills and, um, a dog who will play with toys and play with them in a way that communicates that they enjoy this game and that it mm -hmm. is reinforcing, I meaning it's working to increase behavior. Um, that's a really valuable thing to have. And so, uh, you know, coming from bite sports, we've spent so much time working on toy play mechanics mm -hmm. that um, it is, I find myself using them all the time um, to build, build drive or build desire um, and build these reinforcement systems with our pet dogs. And so it doesn't have to be, you know, a French linen bite tug, but it could be, you know, anything the dog enjoys, uh -huh. but I do need to know that when I give it to you, you, you can bring it back to me. You can let it go. Um, you can tug in a way that works for both of us. If it's, you know, a little dog or a 90 pound mastiff, right. uh, we can play in a way that works for both of us. So toy skills, um, competing desires, you know, I think that's, that's a big one, especially if we have pet dogs who, um, you know, my, my herding breeds, my terriers, um, any of the dogs that have really big feelings about mm -hmm. things, um, and they really want things and they want what they want. And then they often get labeled stubborn, maybe some of the Arctic breeds mm -hmm. work, work here <laughs> yeah. as well. Um, but how to how to say okay i understand that you have these competing desires and if you work with me i will help you meet those needs and i will help you attain those things that you want um in a way that works for us together mm -hmm. um so and i know that it i'm raising an akita right now and i'm using some of the same skills that is a very it's a little bit different application yeah um but it's it's the same thing right it's the same here's what you want and here's how to get what you want. Uh -huh. Like I'm your teammate in this. Um, I have the thumb, so I control a lot of what's available to you, but um, I will help you get what you want. And it just, that, that works. That's how, that's how this works. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think that can be hard for a lot of people too, because a lot of people want what they want to work work for the dog. And that's not always the case. We have to be really observant and really make sure that the reinforcer that we're using is something that the dog wants, you know, and then vice versa, if it's not work on building it, but we can't just make assumptions about reinforcers and what's reinforcing to our learner. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. It is. Um, it isn't like, it's, it's an interesting um, puzzle, but it's yeah. also important because, um, Again, like with, with my bite sport dogs, I don't think that me giving a piece of kibble during bite work is really reinforcing, but if she can't take that, like, and like, granted, there's a lot of steps to get to that point yeah. and there's a lot of work, but if she can't take that, that is information for me. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then with pet dogs, 
okay, it's I think it's easy to say, well, all oh, they they don't like food or they don't like toys. Um, but sometimes you can't get what you want right now. It's not available. Mm-hmm. You can't go chase the squirrel across the street. And mm-hmm. so setting up those scenarios where it's like, I know you want that, that, that tug on the ground, you want that, but I Mm -hmm. need you to actually come to me, eat food, play, stay engaged, and then I'll send you to that. Um, so those things can be worked on, um, like you said. And so it's, it's building it up and understanding that, um, we need a robust reinforcement strategy, um, a robust toolbox, uh, and the, the more we have, the more we can do. Yep, absolutely. So I know that uh, in this sport, you are, as you've mentioned, utilizing positive reinforcement training. You like working on the puzzle in that manner, reinforcing the dogs and, and taking those mistakes as feedback to then change what we can do in that setup or, or with working with the dog. And obviously our audience is on board with that. They, they wanna utilize those positive reinforcement training techniques. But in some sports, it's not always as easy to get information. So talk to us a little bit about how you would recommend somebody start getting involved and and what resources might be available to them. Um, So I think as far as what bite sports are going to be available to you, the the big, for most people, the limiting factor is geographic geographic area. Um, Mm -hmm. So if you have if you don't have a ring sport club in your area and you want to do that, you're going to be looking at a lot of travel and like virtual private lesson. I mean, it's just, it, it's just much easier to do a sport where you have a somewhat local club um, because it, it is, it's a resource, no matter what sport you do, it's resource intensive. Yeah. Um, it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of space. It, you know, it just, it takes, just takes a lot. So that's one thing to look at is, is there a club near you? Um, and then to an extent that like your dog, whether your dog enjoys the game or not is going to be mm-hmm. a big part of it. So, um, and I, when I started with the Doberman, he didn't enjoy the bite sports and I have a lot of regrets surrounding like how long I stayed with it, trying to kind of force a square peg into a round hole. So I'm a little bit sensitive to that, but mm-hmm. In both in IGP and in Mondio, there are avenues for, for I'm gonna put it in quotes, off breeds. Um, so breeds, like there's non-biting options. Um, and keep in mind that every breed can do the biting, por- like technically can do the biting portion. There's mm-hmm. not a breed restriction, um, but you, you know, it, it may be a longer road or your dog might not enjoy it. So right. um, in IGP, there's, there's several BHs that you can do now. Um, I, I'm, they're relatively new, like 2017, I think they changed it and added. So I'm not familiar with all of them, mm-hmm. but you can also show, like once you have a BH, you can show in just tracking or in just obedience if you want. So if you want to get your feet wet that way, um, you can do that. And then in Mondio, there's just the obedience portion you can do. Um, and you can do it with jumps or without. So again, if you have a small, like if you have a small dog or an elderly dog or whatever, um, you can do it without the jumping portion. Mm-hmm. And so again, that's a good way to kind of get your feet wet, see what you like. And because it is, like, it'll make a trainer out of you. Um, it's, yeah. it's, it's a very, there's a lot, there's a lot in it. Um, and so if you're interested and you have a club near you, you can definitely explore it that way. Um, <clears throat> the one thing that I will say that I Kind of wish that I knew back then um, was how clubs work a little bit more. So um, keep in mind that for the most part in this country, it is not pay to play. It is a group of people who are all, it's their hobby. And so if you're coming there, you want to bring some, like be able to provide some, some benefit to the club in some way. So just be aware of that. It's not like going to a class. Mm -hmm. Um, It's, it's a group of people who are working to title their own dogs and like work together. So you just want to make sure that you can show up and bring, bring some value to the club or look at paying for lessons, which um, now we can, we have a lot more virtual options. Yeah. It's a lot more common. Um, But that's, I think that's a, 
a stumbling block for many people. I, it certainly was for me at the beginning because I, I just didn't understand that as, as much yeah. um, as I do now um, because it is such a resource intensive sport. Yep. Yep. That's great. I know you gave us some links, so I'll be sure to include those in the description so that everyone can find those. Um, got a link to a video. We have some rules and then some different um, clubs that people can start to dive into. Um, for anyone who's looking to get started, Nina, any tips or tricks or things that you know now, you know, besides that, besides the clubs and how they work that you wish you would have known when you first got started? I'm sure there's a bunch. Um, I'm yeah. sure there's not just yeah. one. <laughs> yeah. I think the big thing is finding, finding a community and keeping an open mind. Um, so there's lots of different ways to train and there's, there's, go there's lots of people in the sport and just because you don't train the exact same way doesn't mean you can't learn from them. Mm -hmm. So I think um, listening more, talking less, particularly if you're very passionate, like I think a lot of, I, you know, I think back to when I, you know, started training and, um, you know, I was just very passionate and, you know, wanted to talk about it a lot. Well, if you, if you're, if you're joining this new world, even if you end up with um, a club that uses different methods or trains differently than you, you can still learn a lot. And there's um, some of the best advice I've gotten for handling. So not necessarily training, but handling a dog came from some very successful people who, who like you could not separate our training styles more if you tried, um, but they had great handling advice um, that they were willing to share. Mm -hmm. um, so I think just being, keep being open to that um, and, and asking like what, what you can provide are probably my, my biggest tips. That's great. That's really good. I like that. And I think that's very true. I, you know, we all know what we like and know what we want to train and we can get really jazzed and really excited about it, but it's always important to respect everyone around us. And, and like you said, be open, you know, be willing to talk to people about things, be willing to listen to people when they, because they've been in the sport for a very long time. And, you know, even if it's not exactly how we do things or how we want to do things, there's still so much wealth of knowledge there, you know? Yeah. So. Well, and just understanding um, if it's a different sport or different, like understanding how and why things are working the way they are. Mm -hmm. you know, that's a big one. Um, so why does this work? Um, you know, if, even if you're looking at another sport, you know, why does the way they, they do things in fly ball, why does that work? to create the behavior it creates. So yeah. even if you never do fly ball, you can learn from that. So mm -hmm. if you never do bite sports, but you're interested, why do, why do these things work? Yeah. Yep. I love that. I think that's a great piece to think about. Well, Nina, thank you so much for joining us today. I learned a ton. I, I really enjoyed listening to you talk about the sports. I can tell it's something you're really passionate about and I can see how intricate it all is. There's a lot of little pieces that go into building all those really precise and fluent behaviors. So I have a lot of respect for what you do. Thank you so much for sharing all that with us. All right. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Yeah.